what's behind the anxiety is a lot harder to get in touch with. And sometimes it requires like tapping into parts of you that you don't let speak up. Yeah. And it's through the discomfort that you eventually get to start feeling something new. The whole theme is basically showing up for yourself. I've heard this happening a couple enough times now that I'm like, is this the future? I'm so worried about them not abandoning me that I'm abandoning myself. You're never going to believe that this person accepts you if you haven't shown them who you are. Wow. Welcome back. This is our podcast. We've titled it Not For Everyone. And you know that is true. How are you, Jess? I'm good. I was I was about to fill in the sentence the same way. So I'm glad. We're very Thank aligned God. today. Our energies yeah. are aligned. We've been talking for two hours money. already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then one of those days. Can I tell you, actually, this is not what I, this was not the initial bit I thought I was going to share, but let me just tell you how I spend my morning. Let me just tell you how I spent the last 24 hours. I had a very special top secret errand that I needed to run, which I'm not going to share because it involves a gift for Justin. Um, but I have been trying for like two weeks to go to the specific store that I need to go to in D.C. Very specific, unique little store. I've been trying for two weeks to go and it's not open or it has weird hours or I have a meeting then I can't get there. No one picks up the phone. Yesterday I got in the car and I drove for an hour and traffic got so bad. It, the store closed before I even arrived there and I turned around and drove home. My um, I was like on the phone in the traffic on the phone calling the shop being like, can you please stay open for just like five more minutes? Nobody picked up this morning. It was the only thing on my agenda this morning. This morning was the only thing on my agenda to go to the store because I'm running out of time to do this thing. And it's time sensitive. Go to my car first thing in the morning and I'm double parked. I can't leave the driveway. My car oh, at is your parked apartment. into the driveway. At my own fucking apartment. I am oh double parked in. I just like there's like a worker's car there. I can't remove my car. So but I have to go. So I just immediately called an Uber. Put in like the uh, the name of the place whatever looked up the store zoned out in fury in the uber got out of the car <laughs> and then realized i was like this is not the right place i had gone to a completely wrong place it wasn't my fault the store name had the store had changed locations but they hadn't updated their okay. address <gasps> the address was updated on google maps but it wasn't updated in uber so i didn't even think to check on uber so then i had to immediately call a second uber Took the second Uber. First of all, I didn't even bring a coat. I'm standing in the cold because I was like, oh, this is going to be a quick in and out. I'm spending like the whole time like on the street. Get the second Uber. Finally get to the store. It's closed for three days for no reason. They've just put a sign up that they've gone to market. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but it's not. It was not the regular store hours. Someone had gone to market and the store was closed. I had to call a th third Uber. And go home. This is how I spend the whole morning. And still nothing has gotten done. Oh, my God. No good deed nothing goes unpunished. Done. That's what that Ooh. is. You're trying so hard to do a nice thing. And I the universe just... doesn't want you to. <laughs> Literally, while I was sitting there on the front steps of this gone to market store waiting for my third Uber of the morning after my car <laughs> was parked out of my control, I was like, maybe this is a, such a self-involved thought. But I was like, maybe... If I had gotten here on time as planned, like I would have gotten the car crash that killed me or something like I have this yeah, thought sometimes where totally. like maybe it's meant to happen, which is I'm going to immediately say that's insane and egotistical because people die in car crashes all the time. So I'm like, oh, but Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ chose to protect me. Yeah. From yeah. A car crash. It's like there's no there's no sense to this. I hate I kind of hate that when people are like oh and divine intervention protected me i'm like so what does that say about the people who died it didn't but there's protect one them. thing it's one thing when people say that and an accident actually happened and they can maybe like believe it a little bit more it's another thing that you're predicting an <laughs> accident that we have no idea if would have happened <sighs> so that's why i think it's actually not egotistical it's just you trying to make yourself feel better clearly i was just about trying an to make, annoying I, tried, yeah. I was just trying to make the best of the situation by 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 <laughs> theoretically threatening my own life and then protecting it will you go again to this store yeah and when? i have and to how? i don't know they're <laughs> never open and they have the weirdest hours that's why it's taken me weeks it's taken me weeks to go 
It seems like they uh, don't update. Oh, no, but they, their address was updated on Google, just not in Uber. Okay. It was, yeah, which is weird. I didn't, why would Uber have like a different set of addresses? It didn't why would sense. they have a different <laughs> was... partnership? Uber partnerships, you're doing it wrong. It should be Google. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm fired up. I've had like the busiest morning with absolutely nothing to show for it except yeah. like a, te a terrible attitude and a will for a car crash a tour a tour of the city <laughs> did you go all around different neighborhoods <laughs> yeah it was so dumb it was wow so dumb. i'm i'm sorry that reminds me a lot of that story that i've told before of the time that i was mailing a package to my friend and ended up mailing it to myself and <laughs> i had already put it off for weeks and then I was like, okay, today's the day I'm going to be the best friend in the world. And the next day <laughs> I opened my you package locker it. and it's the package because I addressed it wrong. So I addressed it wrong. Address, I mean, okay, you, you, that's, you addressed that word, it wrong. You wait, addressed it wrong. That word is so hard for me. Okay. Here, actually, this is the topic. I, okay. I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking that we do a lot of like, what? I'm going to call it vocab spelling grammar deep dives like yeah, english language ling deep dives <laughs> we're linguistic experts that's actually what that's actually the topic i wanted to bring up we'll get to it in a second okay okay well i felt like we should maybe come up with a segment name because obviously we love segment names here and we always stick to them um right. <laughs> but i was feeling like we should name that anyway Ooh, address, we should address yeah and it's a noun how do you say it address my address yeah, my address. But when you I'm, when it's I'm a going verb, to write down my address. You say address. It's address. Is that yeah, like stupid. proven? Is that like written somewhere? Is it proven? <laughs> <laughs> it's proven that I do that. It is proven that I do that. Some people say address <laughs> both times. No. That's they do. wrong. And some no. people like me say address both times, and that's <laughs> definitely <laughs> wrong. I addressed it wrong. Um <laughs> address write down your address yeah but those people are um british probably yeah you're right or or mean i think <laughs> i actually have better. a i think they're better i have a look i actually have a linguistic complaint okay please as an expert scientist in mm -hmm. this in the field in the linguist oh uh, i've heard this happening a couple enough times now that i'm like is this the future and i'm so upset I was with a friend the other day, a friend who I love, a friend who's not pretentious, whatever. Great friend. Totally. And not anymore. We were, talk we were talking about, yeah, not anymore. We were talking about <laughs> 2020. We were talking about COVID. We were talking about that whole thing. And she said, pandemic. No. P pandemic. P no. And I keep hearing fuckers do this. P apostrophe N demic pandemic. I've never Nobody, heard that in my life. No. Oh, I keep hearing it now. I heard it a few times. First of all, everyone was saying pandemic for the last four years or how long it's been. Everybody's been saying pandemic. And all of a sudden, some of us decided we're special. And I keep hearing people saying pandemic now. No. And I don't, I don't allow that. Let me speak on this. Truly, I please. studied public please. health. This is actually yeah. my scientific background, right. meaning that the word pandemic was relevant to me before we experienced COVID-19 because I just studied invented, pandemic just invented epidemics. Pandemics. I invented them in college and that's it. I've known about them for longer than everybody else. And totally. it has always been pandemic. It's not even like a word that just started with COVID. This is a word in public health. Know. It's pandemic. Yeah. Um, a lot of people during the pandemic were calling it, and I hated this. It was like a cutesy internet thing. Ew. They were calling it the panini. Okay. And, <laughs> That's a whole different thing. That's no, it's thing. not different, though, because panini, pandemic. No, I think what annoys me, <laughs> we're all panini. I don't, we don't even have the time. We don't even have It's the not time. panini. Yeah, those people didn't, they, those people didn't, Is there were cute in that the rest of us, the rest of us were all masturbating and they didn't know what to do yet. So they were like, I'm going to start saying panini and that'll be fun. That'll be how I pass that the time. Is what, that is, those yeah, are two distinct <laughs> groups of people. The ones who are masturbating and the ones who are calling it panini. <laughs> It is clear which end, group we were both in. In the end, none of us got fucked. But 
pandemic pandemic is egregious to me because uh, because I can also see it being the future of like, this is how people are now pronouncing this word. And I actually Why? feel like in my, you know what I feel? You know what I feel? <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I think Rage. it's because, uh, well, A, people are annoying. But B, it's like once you start saying a word a lot, you say it very differently when you're repeating it a lot. And yeah. so pandemic takes a lot more over pronunciation. And yes, if I'm using it all the time, it becomes like pandemic, pandemic, pandemic. But but I but still shoot him in the head. It's so annoying to me. And I can't understand. I can understand being the next generation who hears us as grandparents or whatever will be talking about the pandemic. And like then they just start saying pandemic and then like that's all they know. <laughs> but to be a person, to be like a 30 year old person who a couple of years ago was saying pandemic and now you're saying pandemic, that's your fraud. It's. It's just like not a cutesy word, I guess, is where I'm coming from. Like there are words where you can like slack off on how you say them or give them a nickname or whatever. Yeah. And the pandemic isn't one of them. It's literally a scientific medical term. But I don't like I don't think they think they're making it cutesy, Jess. I think they're just changing the pronun the the emphasis of the pronunciation. I don't think they, they're, they think they're doing something cutesy. I think they're being the people. Wait, what's an example of like? I words? think it's I influenced by the cutesiness. It's like they don't consciously know that they're making it cutesy. But I think there's a tendency in our language today to yeah. like make everything easier, make everything slang, make everything cutesy. And I think that this I, is an example of that without conscious awareness of it. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm going to disagree with no scientific data to back me up. <laughs> I'm going to disagree. I think it's more the camp of people saying croissant. I think it's well, that. I think they're like, oh, we've improved how to deliver this word. It's croissant. So that is no, the it's not. Or that is no, not the... cutesy. I'm saying I think they're. I don't think they're it's trying the to be same cutesy. Type of people. I think they're yeah. just like. I think it's the same people who are like, oh, I've worked on my signature. Like, look how I sign things now. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think no, they're like, look how I say pan. Uh, you know, I feel like there's another word that this happens to a lot, and I'm yes. really trying to think of what it is. Um, <clears throat> it will maybe come to me at some point. I know I mean, what you the mean. The evolution now. of language. You know, I think it's just the natural yes. evolution of language, with which I actually resent. Um, not on the whole, but in the individual. I would like to just speak the language that I was taught, and <laughs> that's all. Like, can I just use what I learned? Yeah, Please? you can. Yeah, Thanks. you can. Thanks. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we covered that. I love when we say okay at the same time. Um, should we get into it? Should we do it? Are we ready to be focused, insightful girlies? Yeah. I think okay. I've been, I've wasted the people's time enough. Let's the give them some, of that let's, give, too let's, let's give them some value now. <laughs> the whole episode, the whole, most of the, most of the episodes are like a penance we're paying <laughs> to make, to make up for whatever we've said at the end. The time you spent listening to us before the value came. That's right. The time it you'll never comes. get back. It okay. usually comes. Um, hey. We're doing a for you. Freaking love a for you. These are our deep dive episodes on focused topics that we care about. And you care about, hopefully. No, actually, I do think that this is something that comes up <laughs> a lot in our episodes and in things that listeners write into us. And the whole theme is basically showing up for yourself and all the many forms that that takes and the many ways that that can look. Um, and the many challenges. Yeah. Hard, y'all. It sounds hard. so obvious, right? And it's like the hardest. It's at the crux of everything. Me well, it's like, what it's does that even mean? Ever. Yeah, right. it's like so many of these values of like being your own advocate, um, acting confidently, not caring what people think, like staying mm -hmm. true to yourself. What is the fucking actionable version of that? What does that mean? Like nobody disagrees to those values on paper. Yeah. But it's not on paper that it's hard. It's in... Um, in real life that it's hard when the thing you're pressing up against is your friend's opinions, your parents' opinions, your crush's um, preferences. Like that's it, it gets really hard in those moments. So hopefully we can hit some specifics and talk through how to show up for yourself more, which I, I would say this isn't something that comes naturally to me in, mm -hmm. in some way. 
Jess, you'll have to tell me if I'm wrong. In some way, I feel like maybe it comes more naturally to you. I feel like I admire you in some ways on this. You'll have to share you. your personal journey to say if that's true. Yeah. But I, my perspective on sharing is not that I'm so great at this all the time. I would say it's something I've had to work really hard and really intentionally to work through. And these are the things that helped me as someone who really relates to struggling with this. But I don't know how you feel. Yeah, I appreciate that that's what you think, but it's totally a, a biased view. You know, like the the way that I present mm -hmm. and the way that people know me is probably pretty self-assured and self-advocating and like showing up for myself. And that's, I mean, it's my number one value, I would say, is like to be authentic to myself and to show up for myself. That is the most mm -hmm. in my life. Like that is what I'm chasing. The whole, I, I think- that's my goal of life. That's my purpose. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I'm trying to get to. Um, sometimes I do it great. Other times I don't. I feel like the way that we interact on the podcast, it's so honest. I feel safe here. I feel like I can trust talk when I talk to you and like I can be open. And so you see me in that context. And then we also work together in, you know, on the more business side of stuff. And that's an area of life where I feel I can advocate for myself and show up for myself. Like I feel very steady career in in like the career and business realm showing up in these ways but in personal dynamics not so much with friends but definitely in romantic relationships definitely with my family I struggle a lot and so it can I don't know I feel like there's probably like levels to it that I've overcome over time I'm sure that career stuff wasn't as easy for me to advocate for myself when I was 22 as it is now at 32. I'm sure that romantic relationships weren't as easy 10 years ago as they are today. And there's stuff that I still feel like I'm a novice at in terms of showing up for myself, like stuff that I'm currently actively working on trying to get better. So yeah, I think it just it applies to everything. And I don't think you can be good at it across the board, even if you're a person that like seems like they have it together in this way. That's so you know? true. I feel like everybody usually has the areas they feel this comes more naturally and the areas they struggle in. Like I'm pretty, one thing I've always felt is that um, I feel pretty confident and self-assured in my relationship with my friends. I can draw pretty good boundaries. I like know how to speak up for myself. I really struggle more with my family and I struggle often more in work. Um, but yeah, everyone has their areas. So let's mm -hmm. fucking kick it. Okay. I feel like maybe ground level of this topic is getting to know yourself at all, being comfortable with yourself. Like getting okay with the fact that the thing you have a hundred percent of the time is you. And, you know, I feel like there's themes of loneliness that play into that, like themes of not wanting to really go deep with yourself or resisting certain things about yourself that you don't want to like admit and get comfortable with and accept. Um, I feel like you have to start there before you can really do any of the rest of it. And I actually had written down, feel like Caroline is so good at this. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, for, for you thinking that I'm so good at some of this, I feel like I get the impression that you are really good at being comfortable with yourself, letting yourself be alone with your thoughts, like mm. um, not being bored when you're by yourself and actually really enjoying and reveling in it and like letting yourself do whatever feels good and think deeply or turn off your brain or whatever. Like, I feel like you talk about it a lot. And I feel like you're a person that I look at and admire the way that you approach that sort of thing. Ooh, so thank you. I don't know if that resonates, but do you have like, where would you start when you think about that topic? Yeah, it's not a super easy answer, but hopefully it's relatable. Um, I do feel people write in a lot about like, how do I like get more comfortable spending time alone? How do I do solo dates? It feels intimidating, but I want to be that person. But like, how do I be happy being single, blah, blah, blah. And I do very much feel that way now that like I love and crave spending time alone. Like I literally, this is so lame maybe, but I will start like dancing and singing 
walking back from the gym alone or like just having like a great time alone. I'm often literally dancing and singing and that doesn't necessarily happen to me with when I'm like around people. I love spending time alone. Um, That's so embarrassing, but it's also not because it feels great. And I will say I was not naturally that way. Mm. So if you're not naturally that way, there is hope. I was a middle child with uh, one of four kids in a busy family, and I was very much like a mediator persona in that family, meaning always like trying to bridge the gaps between people and be the main communicator and like I feel like I have to entertain people. By the time I went to college and was living with friends in apartments or dorms, I always needed someone around. I always needed people around me. I hated being left alone. I never spent time alone. It was terrifying to me. And I remember seeing friends who could do it and I didn't even aspire to it. I was like, no, Mm. Um, that's how fervently I was in this other camp. And then I spent a lot of lonely years in my twenties. And um, there were years where friends moved away, where I was a bad friend, where I went through breakups, where I was uh, indulging in some unsafe, like partying behavior and really isolated myself. I went through some really lonely years. Then I moved to Ohio. I'd kind of gotten my shit together, but was just ended up in a very isolating experience there. So I feel like I went through a boot camp of many years of spending time alone. And it was in the beginning and at certain times, super painful, super sad, super uncomfortable. And it is also the space in which I grew very slowly into figuring out what I actually like to do in my own time, how I like to spend time, what I find valuable there. Um, But basically, like, it's not like you say a magic bullet answer, but the more you do it, the better you will get at it. And the fact, if you're someone who never spends time alone and you try and you're like, oh, but I don't feel good. I'm not genuinely enjoying this. It doesn't feel natural. It feels uncomfortable. Don't let that discourage you. Like that is, that's the process. And it's through the discomfort that you eventually get to start feeling something new. That's true for basically anything in life. But if you start trying to do that, amazing for you that's it doing scary things doing the hard things is like what life is all about and growth and evolution is all about and the fact that it might feel so uncomfortable at first is not an indicator of your capacity or lack of capacity to actually grow into it that's what i would say yeah first of all i think it's really funny every time you say magic bullet as like jess says and i realized recently that the word the phrase is silver bullet i think oh but magic bullet but i always say magic bullet and a magic bullet bullet. is a type of blender yeah that's a blender okay it's not like a blender what i'm gonna say is not like a blender it's not like a blender but it's kind of like a a bullet maybe um anyway yes damn i totally agree with what you just said about like the way to get better at this is just going through being really bad at it. I think that's yeah. the answer. I was thinking about that this morning in preparing for this episode. Like everything I think we're going to talk about when it comes to showing up for yourself and knowing yourself and like accepting yourself starts with doing it wrong and going through a lot of discomfort, a lot of pain, a lot of loneliness, a lot of hard times. And then through that you like build a muscle for it and you're like okay Mm -hmm. like this is what this feels bad like I'm actually at rock bottom right now maybe and so anything that's not this is improvement and just like experiencing that over and over until you build a muscle for it and it becomes something that you know how to navigate you know two three four ten a hundred times later um so I just really agree with that premise like you have to go you have to let yourself be lonely. Yes. To feel feel it out, without yeah. Feel it. To figure out you won't how, enjoy like, it. in the future when that feeling comes up. Yeah. You know what to do with yourself. You know the things that you, you yeah. can turn to. And also it just feels a lot less uncomfortable. You know, you're like, okay, totally. I'm feeling that loneliness feeling, but like I'm familiar with it. Like, okay, let me go. And I think take it's, a walk. 
I think it's the same like you think of someone trying to grow in the opposite direction who loves their alone time and is really protective of it. And then they get into a relationship and they get like those like they get a little antsy and my privacy is being encroached on and this isn't comfortable. You would never be like, oh, my God, you're not going to be good at this then flee. It's like it's going to be uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable and yeah. you're going to grow through it. You're going to th grow through the discomfort. The other thing I think a little more actionable that I did do and I think relates um, is at some point. When I was in my young 20s, I'd gone through a breakup, super toxic relationship. And I don't know where I got the notion that it might have been a codependent dynamic. Maybe a therapist said it. Maybe I was just reading. But this concept of codependence occurred to me. And I was like, Rrr. the more I read about it, the more that rings mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And I eventually went to, I remember going to Barnes & Noble. And I pulled out every single self-help book or like diagnostic manual I could find on codependence and perched up in a corner of Barnes and Noble and sat and read as much as I could read. Literally an employee came up to me and told me that I wasn't allowed to have that many <laughs> books out, which I was like, what? yes, I am. The fuck it. This is, yes, I am. That's what happens here. But this is like to immerse yourself in learning about codependence might be really helpful if you're someone who really struggles with spending time alone. And the thing that made me think of that was I remember this is kind of like a symptom of codependence. I remember that in that very young relationship I was in, if he asked me what I wanted to eat for dinner or what did I wanted to do that evening or how I wanted to spend the weekend, I could not answer. I didn't have an answer. All mm -hmm. I wanted was what he wanted to do. All I wanted, like I genuinely wanted to do what he wanted and not having a sense of what you yourself would like to do with your time can be an indicator that you might be codependent. It's not a death sentence um, at all, but it's just like a dynamic that for me reading about it a lot really helped. And, you mm -hmm. know, I went to therapy and stuff. It's it's not a, it, it, I don't mean to say it like this big, ugly word, but um if you feel like you're lacking like your own gravitational pull around you as opposed to around other people, you might want to look into reading about codependence. Yeah, that is such a that's such a good topic to get into. I feel like I have known for a really long time that I have codependent tendency tendencies. I grew up in a household that I would say was pretty codependent in a family mm -hmm. that is pretty codependent. The word that my therapist has used a lot with regard to my family is um, enmeshment, like family structures mm -hmm. that are like deeply enmeshed. And so I became aware of that when I started going to therapy when I was maybe 24. But I actually don't think that I really have seen visible signs of progress on like my code breaking the codependency pattern journey until the last like year or two. It, it's, uh, it's really weird how like you can become aware that you're participating in this pattern that's not serving you and then still not break the pattern for years and years and years even if you're doing all the things and doing all the work and letting yourself feel and blah 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 the therapy stuff um and I don't really know that there's like a way to speed that up like I think it just all of a sudden starts to click or you start to apply it in little ways and then again build a muscle for it and like it gets more comfortable but even just last weekend it was St. Patrick's Day weekend. That's a huge thing in Chicago. I don't really give a shit about it. Like, I've never cared about St. Patrick's mm -hmm. Day. And um, people were texting me to go out. And I had said to a couple friends, like, loosely said, oh, yeah, maybe I'll meet you there. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll meet you there. And then come that day, I was like, I don't want to do anything. And I bailed on everyone. And I stayed Love home it. alone. Mm -hmm. And I had a great day. And... It was what I wanted to do and I had no guilt about saying no because I knew that I was doing the thing that I wanted to do and I felt really like I found it to be a very profound moment of like oh this is what it feels like to actually know what I want and then do what I want like that seems simple but I feel like I spent many years carrying on a codependent pattern that I had grown up with into friendships relationships just like how my social life looked 
and doing stuff that like I thought I was having fun doing. I always have said about myself, like, I'm good as long as the people I'm with are good. And that is that's kind of true. That's codependence. basically codependence. It's, yeah, it's kind of true. Like, I see myself as a pretty flexible, adaptable person. I think that's something that I value about myself. It's not like I have to totally erase that about myself. But at mm-hmm. the same time, I realized that some of it was just like me completely overlooking my own needs and my own desires so that other people would be happy and so that I would be viewed favorably by them. And really only within the last year do I have these little moments over the weekend saying no to mm-hmm. friends, whatever, where I'm like, oh, this is what it is that I've been working towards this whole time. Um, I do think that's huge. I think it's totally huge. And um, I think anyone can relate to that because underlying that feeling, I would think my experience of that is like, well, if I don't go out and meet them and do what my friends want, then I'm, then I, then I won't be lovable. Then I, Mm -hmm. then they won't choose me as a friend. Then I'll lose them. Then I'll be alone. Like whatever the fear is, you have to, you have to get honest for yourself about like, why is doing what other people want the thing that you just want? Um, what's the fear? What's the threat? Yeah. And um, I think when you can grow into a place of like, there, you know, I can make a different choice and still be a per- person worth choosing, or I can be alone and still be, you know, still have a sense of value. Yeah. Um, it's a big, big change. I think for me, the codependence thing is really tied up with a fear of abandonment and something that I've also been realizing lately. And I talked about in therapy just last week was so much of what dictates like what I do in my life is not wanting to feel abandoned by my friends, family, loved ones. And something clicked where I was like, I'm so worried about them not abandoning me that I'm abandoning myself. Like Mm. there actually is a trade-off. There actually is a cost and a price to just kowtowing to what other people think. And you think you're being flexible and you think you're just an easygoing person. And it's never really like created an explosion in you of like, I can't do this anymore. But just this little buildup and little like hum that exists at the bottom of you of like, I do things for other people before I do things for me. And I don't know, you almost think of that as a good thing. We went to Catholic school. I feel like that was a celebrated value. Um, And only recently, again, have I realized like the, the motivation for me to do that is that I'm afraid of abandonment from my loved ones. And the trade off is that I'm abandoning myself. And mm-hmm. when you look at it that way, the the choice seems really obvious. It's like, if I'm abandoning myself, then who cares if I'm not being abandoned by anybody else? I'm abandoning myself. That's the only person I got forever. And I'm yeah. letting her just like fly by the seat of her pants and do everything that other people want to do. It's not worth it. All of that love and affection from them is not worth it. And then, of course, you also realize that you're not going to lose those other people either by standing up for yourself and doing what you want it's like you can have yeah. both but <clears throat> if the only you way have to choose yourself first yeah if the only way you're keeping people is by what you give to them what you how yeah. you serve them they're not real relationships of substance um like we give all of us give to each other to some degree but i don't only stick around with my friends because of what they do for me what they give me like I like their soul I like them as people same with my family and the thing that I um, am projecting I don't know if you relate to this but listening to what you just said one of the biggest side effects of living like for other people oftentimes is resentment Hmm. there's something very very different about like doing things selflessly giving to people just because you love them, giving to people because um, you just know it's what will help them doing things because it will make their lives easier. That's very different. That's lovely. And we all should and do do that. But that's very different from accommodating people and doing things for people so that you will be treated 
and seen a certain way. Mm -hmm. That's when you get to like, you know, I think there's a stereotype of like the parent or the mother who gives everything for her kids and she sacrificed everything and I did everything for you and I can't believe how I'm being treated. It's like if you are giving something quote unquote selflessly and you're going to have resentment at the end of it, you're not giving selflessly. It's yeah. not really for other people. If if the price at the end of like someone, if there's only like a specific way people are allowed to receive your selflessness, otherwise you're going to resent them. It's not selfless and it's not for them. And you'll probably end up running those relationships into the ground anyway. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that really helped me to think about like, what's the difference between just loving people and um, doing some kind of like codependent pattern and it's like is there is there resentment at the end of it I feel like the hardest part of that is getting honest with yourself when it is fueled by resentment or where there's resentment on the other side of it for me it's hard for me to admit to myself that I would be doing things for people that I care about expecting something in return and yet I know that that is true and that is okay it's like part of the human existence I think that sometimes you do things selflessly and sometimes you do things and there's kind of like a trade or there's kind of like something you want to get out of it I don't think mm -hmm. that's inherently bad but I think being honest to yourself about when it's one and when it's the other is the key and or how I, extreme the balance is really yeah exactly and I find it hard to let myself admit I did that thing for my friend I went above and beyond for them when they were going through their breakup and you know, showed up for them in this, that, and the other way. Um, and like, yes, I care about them and I want to do that. But then part of me also wants to be rewarded for it, to feel recognized, to feel appreciated, to feel loved. And if they're going through, I've had this exact situation happen where I felt like I really kind of bent over backwards for a friend going through something. And I did it out of the kindness of my heart and out of caring for this friend. But at the same time, I was receiving kind of mixed messages about their appreciation for my efforts because they were going through something and they weren't really like able to say clearly every time in a loving way, I see that you're doing this for me. Thank you for doing this for me. I'm going to be a good friend in return. And that's okay because they were dealing with their shit. But that really um, just really like irked me. And then I had to deal with this cognitive dissonance of like I did this because I love my friend but I guess now that she's not really like showing up in the way I thought she would as a response I don't want to do it anymore and so like was it for her or was it for me um I find that yeah. really really hard I don't know yeah. I don't know if there's like a clear way to differentiate I think it's kind of human nature to want both sometimes I think there's some of both yeah yeah, I don't know. But I do think there's something to that of like being, I mean, being to do, clear on what your intentions are. Totally. To do, I mean, to do something nice for anyone and to have like no appreciation at all, not even a thank you or something, that can wear anybody down. And that would be yeah. strange in almost any scenario. But if it's like, I only want to extend myself for this friend going through a breakup so that they like laud me and whatever right. I, I just I think it's how much you need that um that's true yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I yeah I totally totally relate hey this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp if you're not familiar BetterHelp provides online therapy this is what I'm going to say about BetterHelp a couple months ago I mean obviously everybody knows Jess and I are obsessed with therapy we won't stop talking about it a few months ago I was looking for a new therapist through my insurance and I think I talked about it on the podcast it was like pulling teeth to find a therapist get an appointment and god forbid I'd been in like a serious acute mental health crisis I don't know how anyone in that position can be expected to connect with professional help for themselves so what I do really love about BetterHelp is that they make it ridiculously easy to get connected with a therapist you fill out a questionnaire you get matched with a licensed therapist you can switch at any time it's entirely online designed to be convenient and flexible which is the thing you need most when you are really struggling in life. I've been in therapy for the last 10 years. I actually just the other day got a you're my favorite client from my therapist. So it's worth it. It's worth all the time that I've put in. And not only that, but 
It really has helped me with so many struggles in my life, big and small. I've learned so much about myself and how I show up in relationships with others. And it's honestly taught me how to stand up for myself and voice my needs, which is something that I didn't even realize was so hard for me for so long. But I can thank therapy for for getting me there. Yeah, therapy has helped me a lot with kind of growing out of my people pleasing tendencies. And I will say if you're in a spot where you'd like to improve the quality of your life, make it as easy as possible for yourself to get help. If you're thinking of starting therapy, I would give BetterHelp a try. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. You can visit betterhelp.com slash not for everyone today to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash not for everyone. So we got a listener DM that was about kind of about friendship but I think the root of it is actually more about the self so they wrote I feel like I have no true friends because I don't open up to them about my struggles after ending the relationship with the love of my life and partner of five years I let my friends know as a matter of fact six months after it happened and after I'd already moved on to a different country to escape the breakup I felt cringe announcing it to everyone and quickly moved on to another subject. Recently, I've been feeling lonely and alienated from my friends for this reason and have decided to open up more every day. I absolutely hate it. The moment any negative things come out of my mouth, I feel immense regret, like I'm trivializing my feelings. I'm immediately disgusted with myself. Should I persevere? I live in a country where complaining is culturally frowned upon, um, but I do feel lonely and longing for that connection. So it's kind of a weird, complicated one. I don't even know. I I haven't even processed it fully, but I thought it was a really interesting DM of like wanting to connect with other people, but feeling complainy and cringy when you open up. And I feel like that has to be rooted in your own relationship to yourself and how much you let yourself actually feel things. It almost seems like you wanted to run away from the feelings around your breakup more than you wanted to face them. And then that translates into how you might open up to other people about it. Um, So I don't know if there's much to go off of there, but I thought it was interesting. Well, I guess I had like two immediate thoughts. The first of like, if there's a cultural difference in a country, that can Mm -hmm. be a real deal breaker. Like there are severe, very real cultural differences um, just within even different parts of Europe, within different parts of North America. That's even true, like in like, different parts of the United States, Mm -hmm. people connect differently. Um, But to talk on the like the topic of opening up, I think what I hear is like also, yeah, fear of abandoning, a fear of um, not having that trust that whatever the truth is for you and who you are and what you feel and what you think and what you need, that that will be ugly to people or not desirable. And I haven't struggled with opening up as much in friendships, but I've struggled with it a lot in my with my current boyfriend um, in the beginning of our relationship. So I'll share something that helped me. Like I felt very protective, um, walling off parts of myself, censoring myself, not wanting to show who I was. Wanting to be able to fully verify first that I could trust this thing, fully Mm. verify for sure that I could um, be safe here. And eventually my therapist was like, you're never going to believe that this person accepts you if you haven't shown them who you are. It is by testing the ice and putting your foot on the ice that you get to find out if it's able to hold your weight. Mm -hmm. It is in doing that every single time you put your foot on the ice, you get to build that trust in the relationship for friends or romantic relationship. It's by taking those risks. It's not by, um, you don't get to secure the, like the certainty first. It is by taking the risk. And in fact, in any relationship to pursue certainty and eliminate doubt completely, the pursuit of that will actually ruin it. The pursuit of certainty um, will probably actually ruin your trust and ruin uh, the intimacy of any relationship. Like there is a leap of faith you have to take and you can take it in bite-sized ways, but 
I mean, to me, it's the fear of, yeah, somebody's not going to love you. Someone's not going to accept you for the real person you are. But the only way that you get to find the people who do is by showing them who you are. That's the only way. The, in fact, the like the activity of keeping yourself under wraps kind of um, perpetuates the idea that people can't accept you because then I'm hanging out. I'm talking to this friend and she doesn't even know who I am. So it it just mm -hmm. it just perpetuates and reinforces that in my experience. Yeah. You become like two ships in, in the night. You're just missing each other and like not mm -hmm. not being able to find common ground. I like what you said about pursuing that certainty that you can trust this thing is actually the very thing that will erode the trust because. Mm -hmm rather than showing that's not what trust is that's proof yeah you're looking rather for proof than, that's not the same as trust. extending the olive branch of like okay i'm gonna say this thing about myself and it's taking a lot for me to say that but hopefully you can kind of meet me there and then we start to form the trust you're just deciding for them that they can't handle that and that they can't handle you and then it's you're doing the opposite because then they don't feel trusted it's self-fulfilling no way that it can yeah it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that's right so I think that part is the biggest thing that I have learned is like, and I think for me, it is shows up more in romantic relationships than friendships too, of like, I have to step on that ice. I got goosebumps when you used that analogy. That was really good. Um, a high five. <laughs> I <laughs> have to step on the ice and test it. And yeah, test it really. Like, I hate to say test in the context of a relationship, but it's like, it's extending the olive branch. It's like, let me go one foot forward and see if you come with me, see if you meet me there, yeah. you know, and, and then we can do another foot forward. Yeah. If you share a joke that doesn't land and it's your real sense of humor and like, it doesn't land here. I'm not going to say it's not heartbreaking because it is still heartbreaking. Sometimes you want to be friends with people and like, they're not interested. That happens yeah. to me every fucking day. <laughs> but, but after that feeling of rejection is that feeling then of like, well, why would I want to, why would I want to hang out with someone who like doesn't care about my pain from this breakup? Why would I hang out yeah. with somebody who doesn't like my sense of humor? Like truly pretty limited returns on those exchanges. And you only get to find that out if you try it out. I also think, though, something that can happen in that scenario is that you start to change yourself. You're like, oh, they didn't like that. They didn't respond well to that. Well, then maybe they'll like this type of sense of humor true, or maybe they'll true. like if I show up in this way instead or talk about my relationship in this way instead or don't talk about my relationship, talk more about my work, like maybe that will connect with them more. Like sometimes if you aren't secure enough in yourself, if you don't know yourself well enough to be like, I'm going to be myself and see if they meet me there. You can't yeah. test that if you don't know how you authentically show up or if you're too, if you're not solid enough in how you authentically show up and are too quick to be like malleable to the other person. Um, so I think that's, I don't necessarily think that's what's happening with this listener that wrote in, but I think that is a common reaction to, oh, they thought that was weird. I feel like I detected something awkward and cringe and like they just didn't seem receptive to that rather than deciding, okay, they might just not be like a person who I can have that level of closeness with you subconsciously decide, I don't even think this happens consciously, but subconsciously there's something that shifts that's like, okay, be better next time. If you're a people pleaser, I feel like this really is relevant. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm going to show up in this way instead and they're going to like that better. Oh, I'm going to show up in this way instead and they're going to like that better. So I think it's like two pronged. It's like knowing yourself and showing up as yourself unapologetically and then knowing if they don't receive that, that it's not a match um, as opposed to adjusting yourself too much to yeah. fit what somebody else is going to like. It's so hard to distinguish though. I think just the idea, to, the, yeah. the concept of like showing up authentically, I don't find, so I'm like, what does that mean? What does that mm -hmm. mean? If I struggle with these things, well, how the fuck do I know what that is? And something that really helped me, I started doing this in dating and I talked about this, I think on YouTube, but I think it applies, it really applies to any relationship. And now sometimes I do it with any relationship. You have an interaction with somebody, say it's a new friend and maybe I said a joke and they had a weird reaction and I'm feeling really embarrassed and I really want to take it back or I really would feel awkward. I feel anxious, whatever. I leave the interaction. I am going to talk it out out loud to myself. I like to voice memo so I can 
like recorded voice memo so I can go back and listen to it. Um, but I'm talking it out to myself, not to another person. I'm just trying to uncover what I'm feeling there. And it might start off like something like, oh, I said that one joke and like that was such an embarrassing moment. They felt really weird about it. I kind of wish I could text them and like take it back and say that's not what I meant. Mm. And well, I guess I guess what I actually said is what I meant or actually, yeah, that is what I meant. So I guess I'm kind of disappointed that they didn't respond that well, or actually, you know what? It kind of pisses me off. And you, when you start doing a little stream of consciousness, I like what's underneath the feeling. And usually it takes, it, it takes me taking that moment of like, at first I'm feeling desperate and I'm scrambling and I'm anxious and I want to appease them. It takes me a moment alone to break down the feelings and all my thoughts around it to get to what I actually feel underneath, which actually might be like, I'm pissed that you um, yeah. didn't allow space for me in this very legitimate way. Or I'm, and, and maybe, you know, if I don't take that moment privately, then I'll just run full speed ahead with anxiety and embarrassment. But underneath there, there's usually anger or love or care or fear um, anxiety is just kind of like the top level of it. So that mm -hmm. is something I like to do a lot. And in these tiny moments, in these moments of human interaction where you're like, I don't know why I was feeling weird. I don't know why. If you can take the moment, you usually can't figure out why. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a little, um, I think Justin's locked, uh, stuck at the door. Can you let Justin? You yeah. But does that make sense? That. Kind of stream of conscious. It talk does. it out. Do you, do you ever do something like that? I definitely, um, <laughs> it's like distracting to talk to emptiness. So I'm going to wait and okay, collect I'm my thoughts. Back. Sorry, I'm going no, back. it's okay. okay. Um, yeah, I, t I really like that. I think what I've done is instead of leaving a voice note, a very similar thing of like writing it out and writing a letter to the person to myself whatever like the things that I wish I could say about the weird interaction mm -hmm. and just letting that pour out of me and not really thinking about it a ton and usually mm -hmm. it results in the same thing is like I land in a place of like you discover okay something. this is what I'm actually feeling maybe this is what I understand about the way they showed up but also this is how I feel about the way I showed up and so I can like kind of get the full picture of what happened and decide do I want to do anything more about this or do I need, need to leave it alone? Or is that person not for me? Like I definitely will open up a note in my iPhone notes app and just like blah everything and get to the bottom of it. Um, and I do feel what you said about anxiety being the top layer. That's something that I've been realizing in EMDR therapy recently is like I anxiety is a very familiar feeling that comes to me, comes to my body. Like I feel it in my stomach. I feel it in my head. I know what that is. And it's easy to leave an interaction and be like, that made me anxious. I know what anxiety is, but what's behind the anxiety is a lot harder to get in touch with. And sometimes it requires like tapping into parts of you that you don't let speak up. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a conscious, there's like 32 year old smart adult Jess who has been through therapy and has worked on herself and has been through a lot of life experiences and who feels generally secure in herself. And she's not the person that actually I should be asking how I feel when I'm anxious. She's not here anymore. Let's find like the little Tiny the child, inner child who's like the exiled child. in the bottom of my soul, who I yeah. don't ever ask how she's feeling because I just want her to go away because she makes me upset and she makes me anxious. She makes me feel weak. Let's ask her how she's feeling. Mm -hmm. And so it really requires like tapping into parts of yourself that you often try to quiet with your like intellectualized brain um, and being like, how's that part feeling? Let yourself feel the anger. Like maybe maybe cognitively I know this seems a little extreme to be angry about or like anger is unattractive or something. So I'm not going to let it show up. But if I ask five-year-old Jess, who's deep, deep inside of me, how do you feel? She might feel angry. And like, that's who I need to tap into and get to in order to 
process how I actually feel about it or how all the different parts of me feel about it and then move forward. I love that. I love five-year-old Jess. I do actually the same thing. Just recently, I started doing this with young Caroline in a moment where I'm like, oh, I guess, you know, my initial anxious feeling might be like, oh, that social interaction was like so awkward. I said something so embarrassing or like I misread a situation, blah, blah, blah. And I, it's really easy to judge current me. It's really a- easy to hate or to condemn current Caroline. But if I like I have to visualize, I have to literally put young Caroline, like five year old Caroline in that scene. She did that. Mm -hmm. Young Caroline showed up to a party and really wanted to make friends and really wanted to find connection and shared something from her heart. And it was received really poorly and everyone thought it was weird. And like all she wanted was to connect with people. That person I can have empathy for and I can feel anger on her behalf. I can feel like outrage on her behalf. I can feel sadness on her behalf. And all those are very different than feeling just like shame and anxiety. Um, So I I, I love the the child proxy. (laughs) I also think it goes back to the fear of abandonment thing. Like thinking about abandoning that little child in us is unheard of, upsetting. Like I don't want to abandon her. Thinking about abandoning me today it's not that I want to abandon myself as I am in my current age and form but life has displayed over time that like sometimes abandoning yourself is what has to happen to get through a moment or to um get that job or get that opportunity or whatever like sometimes we've learned over time that like shh don't don't tell me what I actually need body and brain like I need to just do this thing because the the picture of what my life is like requires it of me and thinking about that with a kid is not the same and so it can sometimes help me um tap back into like I don't want to abandon myself because it's much more mm, normalized to just like coast over our needs and emotions as adults I think I mean it happened to us as children sure but like me doing it to my own child version of myself is not something that's gonna happen Um, I don't know that was very abstract but follow the picture in your head yeah (laughs) I agree another thing that I've seen people write in about a lot and I really relate to this attitude is people saying like how do I stop feeling anxious how do I stop feeling unconfident How do I stop feeling not enough, blah, 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 blah. And like, of course, yes, we all, no one's aiming to feel unconfident. Nobody's aiming to feel anxious. I also agree. I would like a little bit of relief from that. But there is something to, there is something to knowing that like everyone kind of has their shadow to some degree and everybody has their thing. For some people, it might be they struggle with anger issues. For some people, it might be they struggle with body image or their self-confidence, or alcoholism, or intimacy, or like most of us have our thing or multiple things. And so the idea that like I'm ready and I'm done and I'm healthy once I've eliminated it is kind of a recipe for disaster and disappointment. The idea that like you're not like lovable and whole and ready to be in relationships in the way that you are right now as an anxious person, as an unconfident person, as a person who struggles, There's a trap of that. There's like a self-improvement trap, actually, of always trying to improve the actual like I try to use the term self-improvement less and less because it implies um, that like what's here isn't actually good enough. It's kind of Mm -hmm. the opposite. The attitude of self-improvement is kind of the opposite of a lot of the therapeutic things we talk about. Um, The idea that like, well, I'll be fixed and I'll be good and I'll be ready when this isn't a part of me. Um, And the truth is that there's actually it also probably glosses over the fact that the people who love you. Like they know that you're anxious or they know that you aren't the cockiest person on earth or whatever. And there's probably a flip side of that that makes them love you and also like lends itself to what makes you great. Um, 
So while I, I also personally freak out when I feel anxiety, I freak out when I feel insecure. It's not the state anyone's aiming for. It feels a lot different to just name that that's a part of me. It's not like a foreign, mm -hmm. you know, entity that's encroaching on me. It is a part of me and finding the way to be the friend or be the girlfriend or be the sister or daughter who often feels unconfident or often feels anxious and like kind of embracing it um, feels very different. It it eliminates a lot of that resistance. Yep. Kind of vague thing, but I do think there's a bit of a self-improvement junkie um, pitfall that that means you're kind of never happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have been working on this actively recently, and I have a good example that I was just talking about in therapy. Um, I think like at the core of a lot of the things that I work on in therapy is this notion or this fear really that I can't fully be myself in certain settings with certain people in certain dynamics in certain contexts. And I was recounting a story of a conversation that happened with my family a few months ago. And it really wasn't like a, a big offensive conversation. It wasn't an argument. It was just something that like s my parents and sister were sharing their perspectives on. And I felt like I didn't have room to say what my perspective was. And I kind of shut down as opposed to what I thought would be showing up as myself like the the narrative I had about this interaction was like I couldn't be myself I I shut down as opposed to being myself and I am now doing this form of therapy where we're going really deep on the inner child work EMDR and something shifted like I thought that going into this therapy was going to help me in situations like that still show up as myself and just say the thing that I believe or just be this confident person that I am at work or whatever it is. And my therapist offered a different perspective, which was like, what if you shutting down was you being yourself? What mm -hmm. if that's you protecting yourself? What if that's actually a well-informed mechanism that you've developed in your life totally. where you read a situation and you determine, you know what, this isn't going to be the situation where I speak up. This is going to be the situation mm -hmm. where I quiet down. And that's not you not being yourself. It actually is you being yourself. It's just a different side of you that's more protective and playing it safer and taking less risks and being less loud. And that was like a mind blowing realization to me. I was like, I thought yeah. you're supposed to help me be myself. I thought you're supposed to help me be this like same person I am on my podcast in every context. And that's not what the goal is. That's not I don't think I it's the goal at all of the time. Right. Yeah. But I had this like notion in my head of like, I know myself mm. to be confident and um, vocal and self-assured and have a perspective that I think is valid and important and informed and worth listening to. And of course that has ego wrapped up in it. But I also think in my, in my personal relationships, I generally want to feel that the people that I'm, that I love and care for, like want to hear what I have to say and want to leave space for me to show up in this like full way. And so I thought that the goal was, okay, I would like to show up that way with my family in these awkward settings and situations and conversations too. And just the shift of, I actually am showing up as myself and that's just yeah. that myself isn't self-assured a hundred percent of the time or isn't like vocal about her opinion a hundred percent of the time is such a, such a gentle shift that like changes everything. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also this book that I've been, I won't say I've been reading it because people know I don't read, but I've been looking at it, sit on my nightstand and <laughs> it, <laughs> it was recommended by this therapist and it's called No Bad Parts by Richard Schwartz. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'm holding it up right now. Um, it talks about this same concept of like, there are no bad parts in you. Like all of these things, the things we like best about the, ourselves, the things that we 
wish would be different about ourselves. They are at the end of the day, all parts of ourselves, and they all have a reason for being there and they're not inherently bad. So is it a book um, on internal family systems? It is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a kind of therapy if people want to read about that, which I think is really interesting. Internal family 100%, systems. 100%. Like there's a whole yeah. family within you of all these different parts and they have their reasons for, reason. for showing up at certain times. Yeah. I, I definitely disagree with the idea that we're all supposed to be a hundred percent ourselves everywhere. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, I have a job. Right. Like if everyone, if everyone just gets to say every single thought and feeling they've ever had all the time, no matter yeah. the circumstances, A, we're no longer living a society. B, you're just describing Twitter. Like that's <laughs> not the goal. That's not fucking good for the individual. And it's not good for the community either. It's and. I think there's such a difference between deciding to be quiet in that moment you described because you're afraid people won't like what you say. Like, that's one thing. And it's different to decide to be quiet because you're protecting yourself in a healthy way. It's mm. like if I if I fucking strut through a lake full of sharks, I don't think that's physiologically possible. But if I enter, keep going, keep swimming in this lake full of lake. sharks. A lake, yeah. I don't know how this happened. It's um, saltwater it's, lake. It, whatever, dude. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time one of my legs gets bit, I would be a fool to keep swimming in there without a proper shark cage around me. A perfect metaphor. It's a perfect metaphor perfect. and no one can debate it. Yeah. Like at a certain point, you would be a fool to keep putting yourself in that position if it's going to hurt you. Um, so that, that's actually a way it can be a way of taking care of yourself. I, yeah, yeah. I definitely disagree with the, the goal of being yourself everywhere. Else. There's no self we're different. We're changing all the time. Right. And that kind of makes it harder. It makes it harder because it's less concrete and it's less clear. It's less clear cut. Yeah. It's yeah. less like I am this thing all the time. You're not. Never. Um, Never. I feel like we crushed that. Wow. Are we healed or fucking what? We're so healed. It's crazy crazy out here are you okay. gonna what are you gonna do now what am i gonna do i'm gonna be so long first of all oh, i'm me full of, too i am i'm chock full of a probiotic soda that i'm about to pee out all over this carpet i've been holding it and working up a uti for myself because i love the podcast this much so i'm gonna go pee and then the uti I'm is a gonna, part of you yeah. yeah, the UTI is one of my parts and I can't reject it. <laughs> it's one of my parts. One of my parts is a UTI. Okay, well, um, this has been yeah. not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we have many parts, including a lover and a UTIs. hater who need to go pee real bad. Um, you can find us on Instagram at not the number four everyone pod. You can find us on YouTube. Just search the podcast name. Caroline's on YouTube. Caroline Winkler. And I'm on his Instagram, Jay-Z DeBakey. I think that's it. Thanks for being here. Go on with your bad self. That's it. That's it. Kisses, kisses. <laughs>